Hello. So first of all, Marco, thank you so much for organizing this conference. I'm super excited. It's the first real conference again. So I give like in five minutes high overview about where science stands or where science stood, where science is right now, and where I think science will go in the, uh, in the next decade. So if you think about science, if you look back, most scientists were working on their own. Collaboration almost didn't exist. So scientists were sitting in the home, like Newton, try to get up with some new cool stuff, and then ultimately come up with this big new idea. The interesting thing here is that obviously, as a scientist, you were also a little bit nervous how you communicate your results, right? You don't, didn't know what governments would do, rigid, religious leaders maybe would uh, compromise you. So it shaped also us as scientists, how we think and how we operate. In the last decade, we entered a new phase, which I call the networked science. So in the last 10 years, um, researchers have come into one platform, into one network, which is ResearchGate, which I co-founded with two friends of mine 10 years ago, um, in which now the majority of the scientists of this world are and collaborating. This obviously has changed the way we work. I think the pandemic is a perfect example where countries started to close their borders in order to fight the virus, but obviously the virus doesn't care about borders, um, in which we found at ResearchGate, which is incredible, how scientists didn't care about those borders across, across the globe. And they worked on ResearchGate in real time with each other. So to give you one data point, which I think is the most, or one of the most, um, uh, um, yeah, st most strong, or strongest points to see how you can, how ResearchGate evolved and also how the behavior has changed of scientists in the first five years of ResearchGate existence, all the users uploaded in total two million publications and data sets. And now, every two weeks, two and a half million are being uploaded by our user base. So the amount of data which is growing in our system is growing exponentially. So what does that mean for us as uh, humanity and as, as the scientists? It means we have to enter phase three. The phase three I see as automated science. I'll give you an example. If you play chess, um, you know, in the old days, human played against humans. At one point, human played against uh, machines, and the machines were better than the humans. And now, it's interesting, there are world championships where machines slash algorithms, AIs, play with a team of human beings and against another team with machines and human beings. So the collaboration between machine and human being is the best chess player we can create right now <laughs> in our world. And I see an exact same transition in science. We need to help scientists to get a good understanding of what's out there. So if I would tell you, go work on Alzheimer's, there's no way for you to figure out what's out there in Alzheimer's. But I strongly believe that all the data which is now centralized in ResearchGate needs a new way of doing research and enabling breakthroughs by helping or helping scientists to understand existing knowledge and create out of that new knowledge. And that, I believe, will be the next big stage for not only science, but also for a big next level, not only for science, but also for ResearchGate. Thank you. Thank you. So how many users you have yet? Um, we have now far over 20 million, I think close to 25. 20 million monthly active users. I know, monthly active 100, 100 million, yeah. roughly. And yeah. the funny thing with ResearchGate is, while others pay money for users, you decline them, unless you are a certified scientist. Took me quite a while to <laughs> twist this guy's arm to get an account. But how many scientists are there in the world? And what, what is your kind of, let's say, locked on once a year at least penetration? Yeah, so um, it's tough to count um, how many scientists there are. But let me give you one number, which I think is the most um, compelling one or most understandable one. If you take all the scientists who publish a paper in the last two years, um, or like a peer-reviewed article, um, um, which of like roughly, um, those are roughly 7 million, and of those we have 60% on ResearchGate. Um, 7 million papers. S 7 million people publishing, yeah. um, you know, millions of papers within two years, and of, the, of those 7 million, roughly 60% on, on ResearchGate. That's a which, very famous marketplace, two-thirds majority, and then 
I guess nobody even dares to come into your market. You have some traditional publishers as competitors. And um, the fascinating thing is they perceived you as your enemy and now you're friends. Yeah. And I think it gave you or it gives you probably more credibility. By the way, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, scientists publish work. The world is in problem. I mean, if you start paying $60 per article, innovation will have a lot of friction. So tell us a little bit, how did it change uh, with the publishers? Who is on board? I think you have two of the top three. Yeah. So <laughs> not the number one. <laughs> But tell us a little bit about this. How did you do this? Yeah, so it's very interesting if you work in an industry where the industry leaders uh, try to conserve the industry as it is, it's very tough to penetrate, obviously, this industry. So we were perceived in the beginning, so no one really paid any attention to what we do. Then five years ago, they started to become nervous, the, pu the scientific publishing industry. Um, and may, may, I, may I interrupt? So Please. Reed Elsevier has one billion annual downloads of articles, and IA delivers the same. More than now. Yeah. No, yeah, it, now 2020. Yeah. It was 2020, exactly. I'm all out of date as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, and Elsevier basically, uh, unfortunately, started to sue us um, five years ago. At the same time, um, other publishers started to work with us as Springer Nature or Wiley. Um, and basically, the easiest way of explaining it is like Spotify. So on Spotify, you listen to music, and the music labels gave the music to Spotify, and Spotify distributed the music. And ResearchGate is now ultimately the distributor for scientific research. So the publishers giving us their content, and we distribute this to the scientist. Um, and this started to really take off, um, honestly, in the last year. So we work with Springer Nature for two years already, but now so many publishers are coming to us and want us to, give, to put the content into our system and to distribute this for them. So, and I think this is the, the main um, the big change in science is that you as a scientist are not reading any more journals or um, unfortunately not going anymore to conferences, but how you discover content is via following the right scientist in ResearchGate. And then you see, ah, Marco just published that paper. I want to read that. That's the way you come to content you care about. Um, this is why publishers are so keen now to give us um, the content. Yeah. So uh, a friend of mine, Hardy, who's sitting there, was researching the scientists having opinions on oil drilling in Alaska. And it was quite interesting in his analysis, you could see that corrupt scientists sponsored by petrochemical industry always said, ah, it's not a big problem to drill there, it's fine. And then immediately the serious scientists came and said, actually, it's a really bad idea. And do you have some credibility check for scientists? I mean. I think Thompson used to have the ISI mm -hmm. ranking of the journals, and then as you are referenced as a scientist, your ranking goes up, and then your salary, and you get better promotion. Do you have also like a quality check for scientists? Because there are so many, mm -hmm. and they don't tend to agree. So how do we know what scientist is right and wrong? Yeah. Is there like a peer-to-peer? Yeah, so basically we have two scores within ResearchGate. One is the RG score and one is the research interest score, which gives you signals. One is more longer term impact um, and the other one gives you, shows you like early interest in the work you have. But the early interest, we, we don't evaluate in positive or bad. We just say it's early interest in some work. The good thing about the system like ResearchGate is, and you just mentioned the example, um, and we had a similar example about stem cell research, which blew up Uh, a couple of years ago, is now there's a transparent system where scientists can talk in a safe environment within, sci like within science. And that obviously changes the way how people communicate. And also, I strongly believe it will also change how scientists will do science. Because they know if I do research and now it becomes transparent ah. and the world is seeing this and Marco can read it and can comment on this within ResearchGate, this puts me into a different situation which you know, was different 10 years ago when you published papers and no one really cared about those yeah. papers. Does the scientist need to grow up? Yeah. Is, is this disease of not, uh, not having the stamina to be wrong, or this like obsession to be correct, is that hindering our sustainability? Yes. We had yesterday uh, Steve Jorvinson saying, politicians no chance to bring sustainability, corporates are exploiting the world. 
So are the scientists our hope? And maybe ResearchGate can lead us? Yeah, I think, first of all, scientists have to work better with failures. I think it has to be part, and it is part that of our lives. That was why you started, to punish yes, failure. Exactly, that was how ResearchGate started. I'm a virologist, and um, my failures, I couldn't publish them. But 90% of what I do as a scientist is stuff which doesn't work. <laughs> so this is how it started, basically. That's number one, we have to talk about failures, and scientists have to continue to publish their failures into systems like ResearchGate. And the second is communication. I think the current crisis has shown that science doesn't stop in the communication in science. It just needs to go beyond that. And we thought that the vaccine will solve all our problems. But as we can see now, a strong part of solving all those problems is communication and education. And I think this is also where scientists have to take over responsibility within the next decade to see this part of their job. Do scientists have an organ or an association or a method to rank each other or to a point like a, a consensus or is science by definition to disagree? It's a very Sorry, good, it's a, that, it's a very philosophical question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, depends which philosopher you look at and everyone uh, would say this different, but I think disagreement or falsifying, it's a very helps important, also. it helps a lot. And I think this is how, and I, I see this even in, our, in my company with all the people, uh, some people say it's led almost like a scientific company, um, where we have to disagree, and ultimately, if we're still disagreeing, but we still commit to the end to something we want to do together. Yeah. So it's fine to gather data on the way while you're building stuff, and it's the same in science. You disagree, and, and we did some analysis a while ago, which we should do again, um, you can see this even with Nobel laureates, if you see their citation patterns of their work. Um, you see a lot of denial in the beginning. Well, first of all, nothing happens. Then you see a lot of denial, and then you see a slow start and a slow slope of starting seeing um, how scientists start to agree with them. So you, you, that's just part of your work, and I think that's also the fun part, to disagree, and then at the end show that um, through disagreement and proper conversations you came to the yeah. solution. I mean, I'm definitely not a scientist. Um, I'm probably the opposite. But um, I was fascinated about this carbon credit market because the emissions on the corporate side need to get offset with emissions or the carbon sequestration of the forest. But the world is so complicated calculating this. And everyone agrees that the current method is not the right one. But it, I think, took a long time to agree on it. So now they are kind of stuck with this old system and it feels like innovation is not coming through in the system. But there, this is also a political problem, of course, not just a scientist problem, but I wish the scientists would be more active in uh, telling what to do in this world to keep it more sustainable. Do you have at ResearchGate like a special sustainability tax or can I... Not yet, Not but yet. Let's, uh, let's discuss let's talk that. About let's it. talk about it, right. yeah. Iyad, I'm so happy you're here. Last time it was Berlin 2019. Oh, yeah. yeah. Same cap. <laughs> Love it. Great to <laughs> see you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. The Thank best you. of luck. Thank you.